Awesome. Hello, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Um, let me see who's in the chat. Hey, Bubba's here. Jeeves is here. Reef God. DM's Reef Tank. Um, Aaron's Aquarium is there. Reefer Madness. Who else? Who else do I see? Who else? Yeah, I see Tyler Seymour, my son, who's supposed to be watching basketball and going to bed soon, and Dre Salty Aquatics. Thank you guys for um, for joining me tonight. Um, tonight's special guest is Alex G. Um, sorry, Alex. How do you pronounce your last name? Gawara. Gawara. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, like, what what is that? That is uh It is Polish and Ukrainian. Polish and Ukrainian. All right. All right. Um, so, yeah, Tech Talk is a earlier tonight than usual. It's because I've been having trouble, like, scheduling guests at 9 o'clock. It's been – I've had a lot of cancellations. So I think 8 o'clock is a better time. And thank you for Alex for being my first guest at um, this new 8 o'clock time. I'm streaming from my kitchen because um, living room doesn't have enough light and my kids are watching – LeBron James basketball. So if you hear random LeBron hit a shot or number 23 go, that's my kid. I've locked them away. But tonight, Alex is going to tell us all about his tank. Um, I'll let Alex do the introductions. And if you have any questions in the chat, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll ask Alex a lot of questions um, as he goes on. Um, the link is out there. I will repaste the link, everyone. But if you come in, uh, please just keep it quiet and... Um, just please be a little bit sensitive if you have any background noise. Um, and, you know, once we've kind of finished with Alex, Alex has finished telling us about his system, um, then we'll open it to everyone. But, Alex, I think we'll – you do a lot of DIY stuff. So yeah. don't mind if we, you know, interrupt every now and again and just ask you questions. All right? No. Nope. Just just yell at me and tell me to be quiet. All right. No problem. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Well, I just want to first say thank you, O, for uh, having me on here. I really appreciate it. It's the first time I've been asked to be a, a guest on a live stream like this, so I, that's very uh, very nice of you. So I really just want to say thank you, first of all. Wait, is it the uh, first time for real? Yeah, to, like for someone to ask me to come on to be like a guest specifically to talk about my tank, so other than just randomly hopping on. All right. So... Thanks again for having me. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know who I am, I'm Alex G. I actually have a couple t-shirts I made up because of a recent coral swap I wanted to go to. And uh, I have a 1,600-gallon system, and I will start walking a little bit. If anybody gets too much background noise, please let me know. I'm going to kind of give everybody a nice wide shot of this thing. So that's 720 gallons right there. And that one over there is 480 gallons. They're both plywood tanks. I built them myself. They're only got glass fronts in them. I'll take you guys in the back. I got a whole filtration room, a walking platform, all kinds of fun stuff. And I did this all in my basement. When you said you did this yourself, do you actually mean you put the panels together yourself and like glue the stuff together yourself? Yes. I did. All the all the construction, uh, the stands, the tanks, installing the glass, all the electrical systems, all the humidity humidity mitigation systems, the RODI system, everything. I mean, I know I've seen you on the streams when you said you built everything, but I didn't actually realize, and this is not like a fake shock look, like I. I didn't realize that you actually. I, I remember um, being on Rico stream when like Joey was helping you brace in the tank, but I didn't realize you actually like built the tanks yourself, like build them, build them, build them. Yep. Yep. Built it all from scratch, and you know it's the first uh, first plywood tanks I've built. But got I've done a lot of woodworking over the years, and um, got a lot of experience and. And doing a lot of home construction. My family was all in the skill trades. So I'm kind of the first one that's not. So I've just got a kind of a family history background in all of it. And that's uh, that's kind of what led me to do this. Why I went with plywood was really to save a lot of money. Uh, 
these tanks for both tanks, uh, so 1,200 gallons of display. Uh, they cost roughly four to five thousand dollars to build. Uh, if I would have tried to have these same tanks built out of acrylic or glass and both of the same size dimensions, I'm guessing I probably would have been in the neighborhood of like the, the at least the twenty thousand dollar range for that because they're so big they can't leave the house. The only way this will ever get taken down is if it's in pieces. So if I would have had to pay someone to do this, they would have not only had to construct all the panels, they would have had to come to my home to build it on site. Okay. So. Yeah, it, it's a, a lot of work. It, it's over, over two years I put into this. Uh, could have probably done it a little faster. I was uh, a year and a half of that. I was return to school earning an MBA as well. So I kind of put a little bit of this on hold to get my school work done. Uh, and then that's kind of, I started YouTubing a lot more once I got this all finished up or once I got my school finished up last year, which is just a, a couple months ago. It's been a year since I've been done. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'll flip this around a little bit. So I could see the same thing you guys are. So it's one of my dehumidification methods here. I got a, a dehumidifier that I've got kind of ugly modification to to suck air out of the fish room and expel it in here. Uh, it's just kind of transitioning to summer. So there's a lot more humidity down here than normal, but the air conditioner is just starting to kick on. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to back up and just be a little bit selfish because one of the issues I'm having now is I can't vent my chiller outside. So what you've done there, you literally just taped the back of the humidifier, taped it up, and just like vented. <laughs> yeah, because I I wanted to I wanted to make sure that I had positive airflow through the thing, so I just taped it over and put a duct onto it. So, awesome. all right. I, I really got to replace that old thing. I mean, that dehumidifier has got to be at least 15, 20 years old, but it still works. And that's the reason, too. Everything floor to ceiling is part of this, and a lot of that has to do with humidity. So the first tank here, this is the 720. Uh, don't mind the algae. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. You'll see a, a quite a contrast between the two tanks. They are all tied together. Uh, so this is 720 gallons, eight feet long, four feet front to back, and three feet tall. And then the 480, which you'll see in contrast, is pretty much algae free. And I'll talk about the little trays up front here soon because somebody's been misbehaving. So. Uh, this tank, though, is eight feet long, four feet front to back, and just two feet tall. And the, the expectation is, is that this will become uh, my main full reef tank, and this will be more for non-reef safe fish, such as puffers, uh, angels, large wrasses that can become a real problem in some reefs. And... Of course, the porcupine, too. And one of the newest additions, a uh, juvenile annularis angel. Any questions so far before I uh, I keep diving in here? Um, not yet. Not yet. But you are going to keep that the, the bigger tank, the 720. You are going to – well, obviously, you have some softies in it. So you're going to try and maybe keep some corals that – you know, they're more likely to leave alone. Well, I, I'm kind of looking at it this way. Like, colt corals aren't really expensive. The little piece of Blue Ridge in here wasn't expensive. And as I start to grow frags out in the other tank, uh, that's where I have the potential that I might eventually put some real high-power lighting on here and try to put some SPS in here. 
We'll see, though. We're, we're quite a ways away from that stage yet, and if I do high-power lighting, I don't know if it'll be LEDs or if I might even try halides on that one. Just have to see. So the reef tank, though, uh, if anyone's been on here has been following my channel, I have been going through a lot of algae issues. It's still a relatively new tank, especially for this water volume. I've pretty much taken care of all the, the hair algae in this tank. Uh, there is literally like <laughs> a couple little hairs under that branch that's like the most that's really there. Uh, I finally I'll have gotten it to the point where my cleanup crew can actually kind of, you know, maintain it and not let it become a problem. The, the nitrates and phosphates are both testing zero currently, mm -hmm. so it's kind of utilizing all the nutrients it has available, which is more or less why the algae is in here. It's just of sucking it up as soon as it enters the water. So but that's going to be the next thing. Why does one tank... Um, you probably, I don't know if you're going to get to it, but why does one tank have the tank, the 720 has way more algae and and this tank has none, basically? So there's a few reasons. Um, the biggest is going to be, and um, you'll see like the top of these rocks are kind of cleared off and that's due, oh, there's one of them there. There's one, there's two long spine sea urchins in this tank. Um, the cleanup crew that I have in this tank is extremely minimal. It literally consists of a single fox face, two long spine sea urchins, and I think there's like two snails that are alive in here. And that's it. But the angels might pick a little bit, but they're not going to do much to all this algae. And the thing is, in, in this tank, uh, when I finally got my nitrates phosphates down to acceptable levels, the algae kind of stayed stagnant in here. It was, there was a lot of it in here, but where urchins or the fish had knocked it down all the way to the rock itself, it wasn't coming back. Uh, and so, geez, probably three weeks ago now, I went in here with heavy duty brushes toothbrushes and I scrubbed every single rock that I could get I could get to and removed everything that I could since so I already knew that I wasn't really feeding it anymore through nitrates and phosphates in the water and that more or less has allowed the cleanup crew which is about uh, so there's at least 10 sea urchins in this tank still uh, probably about 30 or so snails, uh, several sea cucumbers, a whole bunch of uh, conches. And they've kind of just been making dents in it a little bit more every day. But I'm going to keep an eye on it for a few more weeks. I don't want to say I'm, I'm completely algae free and this is solved for at least a few more weeks. But we're close. Okay. There's a plan. All right. Any any other questions so far? Um, you said you were going to talk about what those bowls are. Oh, you want to get to that. So, uh, well, you can see through the bowls. I have all my Wesleyphilias in here, or Trachophilias as they've been renamed. It's a really nice... I got two really nice rainbow ones uh, last weekend at a frag swap. And, you know, I was enjoying all my new corals, and I got a couple new clams back there, too, and... Uh, a couple days ago, you know, well, first things first, this guy, which was the very first fish I put in the tank, the Red Cigar Rass, uh, periodically he likes to flip things over like he's doing with shouts. He is strong enough to pick up that blue clam and flip it over. He started deciding that it was fun to flip all my Wesleyphilias on, onto their upside down so the polyps facing the sand. Also doing it with the, the other couple of small Duresa clams back there. That was the first problem. The second problem, which is the first time I've encountered it, is the rabbit fish. Which, two days ago, I happened to just be sitting down here watching everything going, Hey, you look 
you know, you look real happy. You're swimming around. And he came up and bit into my Wesleyphilias and started chum- chowing down on them. And I was like, uh-uh, no, no, no. We're not, we're not having that. So the, those two <laughs> have been served an eviction notice and will be going to the 720-gallon tank. I see. Okay. Wow. I'd rather and, be eating corals. I mean, that is rare. I, I'm i pretty sure I know why this has happened, though. Um, the algae supply in this tank has run way down, and rabbit fish, fox face have a ferocious appetite for it. And I just don't think there's enough. And I, you know, you see, I got a nori clip up here, and I started stepping up the nori feeding. Uh, but I'm a little concerned now that now that we've taken a taste of these, that might not ever stop. Yeah, that's my, that's my experience too. Is once they get a taste for something, they yeah. very rarely stop. And I was watching on my security camera at home from work or I was watching my security camera on this tank from work yesterday and I was having a really hard time not getting in the car and driving home because first I saw him take nips out of all three of them but then a little later on I turned the camera on and all three of them were moved because he decided to roll them all over. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one is biting on them, the other one is flipping them over. Yep. <laughs> So I attempted to catch them yesterday, which I didn't think would go very well, and it didn't. But I have a different strategy that I should have just waited on. I'm going to attempt to get this one at night. And the red cigar buries himself in the sand, and I know where he buries himself. So I'm just going to go in there at night and dig him up into a net. No thought of a fish trap? I might need to do that for this guy. How big is it? I mean, we can't tell scale from the camera because the tank is so big. Uh, it's not crazy big. Um, eh, five six inches. Okay, that's so. That's in your tank. That's not that big. In our tank, yeah, that's gigantic. Yeah. Well, it's it's the like you said, the scaling is hard. Like the bubble coral here, uh, I'll. I'll go top down on this in a bit. Uh, that thing is, geez, it, it's almost a foot across now. Ooh. What size did you buy it? What is it's doubled in size? Uh, I would say easily it's doubled in size. It, it's a monster. So we'll go. We'll look top down on it on a bit. Uh, same thing. I mean that that sea anemone when it's really stretched out, it's maybe. It's got to be in the six eight inch range at least so but yes unfortunately I, I my wife noted she said is that our tupperware that we use for food and i was like yes uh but it's not going back though yeah goes to the goes to the dishwasher a couple times it's all good uh, well <laughs> she's not listening is she <laughs> She just did like I was like we could buy some more. It's not a big deal. <laughs> it's not expensive Tupperware, but that's kind of where uh, where I'm at with this. Why that's like that? I added uh, 23 corals and two clams last Sunday after I got or last Saturday after I got home from the the sea mass swap in Chicago. So. This was just the ulti- This was just the downfall <laughs> of weird bad things to have happen this week. So, sorry to hear that. I hope you. Yeah, so- the good thing is you have an even bigger, probably an even better fitting home waiting for them on the other side. Yeah. I was gonna say that, and even though it's a bare bottom tank, that that won't be a problem. I already have one ras in there that buries itself, and it it's got Tupperware container full of sand and it once it found it that's its little house so i think i'll add one or two more of those to the the other tank and we'll be all set there so all right any other questions so far not so far i mean brian carr is saying that's way too much tank for me and to be honest i think i can i mean i wouldn't do two 
but I can see myself doing, you know, once you have a house and you're pretty sure you're not going to move for 10 years, I could see myself doing, you know, like a, a big tank. I don't know if I'll build it myself. That's just, that's, that's nuts. But um, it, it, for me, I'm not a very handy person, but um, I mean, I'll enjoy your tanks, but that's too much tank for me. It, it definitely is a, a little different level of challenge for me. That's for sure. I think, let, let me know if you think this is true. I think the few times I've seen Joe Yayulo from the Long Island Aquarium speak about really big tanks. He said, you know, um, once you see something creeping up, and I'm assuming he was talking about nutrients, you have to start to steer the ship a little bit. Because yep. if you don't start steering it, if you wait until it gets to a danger area to start to steer it, then you're already in trouble. So you have to do these little nudges. It's not like a tank where you can do like big water changes to kind of get nutrients down. So he says once he gets his nitrate, once he sees his nitrates at five, he slowly starts to steer the ship, you know, because he doesn't want to get it to 10. And once he gets to 10 and gets to 15, then it's a big problem. Yeah. Oh, I, I I would definitely agree with that statement. Is that it, it's a it's kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time because with this amount of water volume, those parameters cannot move very easily. But again, it is like you know, it's like steering a cruise ship. Once it has started its path, uh, moving that path is not very easy, and you you do need to start taking some actions a little early. I, my biggest thing is still just keeping my alkalinity and calcium under control. Um, I'm still tuning my reactor right now. We'll we'll look at that here in a, a few minutes. Uh, I'll show just some of the water filtration stuff I got going. Uh, 200 gallon per day RO DI system with a booster pump. My water pressure here is only 40 psi, so it is <laughs> not nearly enough. Uh, I just keep 200 gallons of water storage on hand. Uh, maybe in the future I'll add more, but this has been sufficient uh, for the time being. If I need to change more than 200 gallons of water out of this, something back to the point of what we were just saying has gone catastrophically wrong and no amount of water changes might be able to fix it at that point. But the hope is to never get to that stage. All right. I have a question from Brian Carr. Something I was wondering: What is the monthly maintenance cost on for the tank, like electric and then food, or a rough idea? Electric cost, huh? Um, I would say this is—is is this a question for me, oh, or for Eric Carr? It's for Brian Carr. Um, listen, my wife listens, so I mean, she's <laughs> thank you, so. I, well, you don't have to answer if you don't. You could give us a rough number. So my my whole house electric bill is a little. It's like two twenty five a month. What? C come on. I, uh, sometime in the summer, with me using a single chiller, my electric my electric bill last month was one sixty nine in the winter in New York. So how is yours for the entire house with those tanks two twenty five? Like what uh, are you doing? I'm almost on 100% renewable energy, and my power is very cheap. Oh, all right. Okay. We pay 19, <laughs> We pay on average 19 cents per kilowatt hour here in New York. Yeah, I think uh, I, I forgot what I looked at my last bill, but I think it's like seven or something. Okay. It's it's very reasonably priced here. Okay. Um, all right. So that's not bad. 220 with renewable energy. All right. Um, and what about like food and other additives and stuff? Uh, I haven't really thought about food before, but I'll just throw a number out and say maybe 30 bucks, 40 bucks a month at this point. And that's going to the grocery store periodically and picking up uh, some live clams or fresh scallops, things like that. And then uh, I do a lot of Rod's foods and a little bit of uh, LRS foods. Do you make do you make or blend your own food or is that something you do or something you're gonna try? I might try it eventually. I mean, I have no problem getting like small things. 
uh, you know, sometimes it, some things, you know, like getting scallops or shrimp, uh, things like that aren't too bad. But, like, you know, getting into some of the more exotic blends that have all these different planktons and stuff, I'm a huge advocate of diversity in food. Uh, so I, I might feed a lot of other bigger items, but I still, I don't think I'd ever completely get off of things like, you know, something like mice and shrimp or you know, some of the other different plankton based foods out there that are getting ocean plankton for them or, you know, some kind of really good protein source like that. I tried blending up my own food. It was just, it, it wasn't really to save cost, but I will say that it was a lot cheaper than doing Rod's food. Rod's is about 20 bucks. And I think after I bought about $30 in seafood, I ended up I mean, it lasted me about five months. I ended up throwing out a lot of it because I just didn't think it was it was very nutritious after blending and then five months in my freezer. But, um, but um, yeah, it was just fun. But like you say, I have about eight different fish foods that I just try. Yeah, and the other one I feed, which I'll I'll show here. Uh, I have two cultures going right now. So this one I picked up from uh, Reef to Reef. I always like feeding uh, live brine shrimp and stuff, but my local guy here does not have any. I'll try to zoom in on these guys, see if you can see them. These are live uh, white worms. Uh, they're they're a real popular freshwater food, and they uh, they live in salt water for up up to a few hours. Uh, and I, I usually try to feed these guys a couple times a week. I, I feed them uh, a spirulina flake or just kind of a mixed flake food. And I got a couple trays of them right now. And I'll just... Uh, how, often, how long do they stay alive just there? Technically, they will live in here indefinitely and grow as long as you replace the soil periodically. They're, they're self-dividing. So, like, I bought, like, a couple little balls of... Uh, worm culture for like 10 bucks a piece and now i've got two trays of it and you know i might feed uh maybe anywhere from a couple teaspoons to like a tablespoon of these a week roughly so they, they grow pretty quick and uh i feed them in part because if anybody's being finicky they'll they'll be enticed to feed on them but a lot more of it has to do with uh, the fact that the fish are eating something that has live bacteria in it and it helps to fortify their immune system and their gut with just putting live bacteria back into them because all of our you know any frozen fish food is not going to do that and I know there's a few probiotic foods that are trying to to get out um but i haven't i haven't really seen a whole lot in the way of them yet I but that, that that's why i feed them um someone is uh, tim's tank is asking what pumps are you using for flow for flow so i got a couple different kinds uh so in in the reef tank i got two gyre 250s and these are both set to 100% random. So they'll, they have enough flow. Um, they keep it nice and gentle in the LPS section because it's underneath. And then the, the further you get down, um, you guys can probably see the Duncan Coral back there is whipping around a lot better. Uh, the flow gets real heavy, and then that I have all the SPS down here. Uh, this is only the beginning of the flow. Eventually, I will probably add some power heads to the back to generate more flow front to back, or, or I should say back to front, just so that I can make a really high flow section here and then keep it nice and docile for the LPS. And then in the 720, I have, which they got to be clean, I have the Rossmont waiver pumps. The waiver mover pumps and I, I do have these two on a controller these little guys um, they push 4100 gallons per hour each so 
And then the, the main drive pump, which is a reflow hammerhead, that's pushing, uh, that's probably pushing about 2,500, 2,000 to 2,500 gallons per hour through it as well. That's so it's a, it, I, I've actually been thinking about adding two more of these and not putting them on a controller and just letting them go. So I, I'd have eh, probably about 16 to 18,000 gallons per hour of water flow in the, the big tank. So, because that one, since it's bare bottom, I could, I could really crank it up in there. And then this tank, we'll see what happens. I don't know if I'll put... Uh, some kind of ecotech pumps back there or if I'll get a couple more gyres I'm I'm really not sure what I'll do back there but as this SPS grows out it's it's definitely going to need more flow added on this side of the tank How have you how long have you been running the gyres have you cleaned them since you put them on Oh yeah um I got a little bit lazy this last time and I didn't clean them for about a month and they were, you know, with all the hair algae and stuff, they were definitely losing a little bit of their push um, just because they were getting a little bit of clogging. But when I got them out, they, uh, I cleaned them out. The only thing I've had that's been an issue with them, which is I think for someone that wants a quiet tank, it could be a very big annoyance. Uh, I don't hear these pumps most of the time, but the last time I cleaned them, I had one of the rotors pressed on uh, a little too much and it was squealing horribly loud um, audible out here even uh, so i had to take it apart and i've had that happen a, a few times to where i get a little bit of minor squeaking but it, it usually passes in a day or two so i've been happy with them though I mean, the amount of flow they put out and then that nice thin strip of flow they put out, it, it just works really nice for this tank. I like I like the gyres. It's, um, I just think they require a little bit more maintenance. Um, but what I do, Alex, is I have an extra one because um, you, you don't need a controller. I think if you have multiple, you can run multiple off of one controller. I hook them up to my Apex. So what I do is I have an extra one. So I, I that is what you just described. I've had that issue a lot of times. So what I do is, so I'm not in a rush to put it back together so I can take my time and really. So what I do is I always have one clean. So I'll put that one um, on the tank, take one off, clean it, and then test it off the tank to ensure that, you know, everything's running well. It's silent because once I put it back on the tank, I don't want to have to take it off again to like take it apart or retighten it. I just keep an extra one on hand. Well, you know, fill my tub, plug it in in the tub, and just test it to see how how much noise it's making. Okay, yeah, that's something I'm probably gonna have to do. I mean, I I've, I've been slowly working in the idea of starting to buy spare parts, like extra pumps. I, I have an extra uh, return pump. Uh, extra seal for the return pump, but that's definitely something I gotta, I gotta look at. I, I I do like the gyres. I do. It's and I'm telling you, they've gotten just. I've I've had my issues with Coral View products, but I have to say this: that the difference between the version two gyres and the version one, it's miles better because it's easier. Uh, have you had one of those version one gyres? No, and that, that was the thing is that when I was building this tank, uh, they had not come out with the real big ones yet, and I was sitting there waiting. Like I think they had previewed them at a show, and I, I know a lot of people that was the big talk was, I hope they don't break. I hope they're easier to maintain, and I, I, I'm happy with them. Yeah, the, the other one, the older one, had a lot of little parts that just ceramic parts um so it, it was just a lot more a lot harder to put back together um so but version two it's much better it just, it just takes a little bit more work like there's a little like ceramic thing and if you push it on too far or stick something in too far it makes a lot more noise you heard mm -hmm. that work sound. oh man yeah i, I know i've been there <laughs> so i i will say these little raw spot pumps i mean 
it's like a hundred. I think these guys are like a hundred and twenty or a hundred and twenty-five bucks for just the pump for forty-one hundred gallons per hour. That's not bad. It, oh, it's, it's a, is that the one that you did that review video for a while ago? Uh, I just did kind of an unboxing and talked about it a little bit. So they do have a controller. They're an AC controllable pump. Have you done an updated video on that, on the AC? No, I'll, I'll have to do one because actually they do need to get another little cleaning, but I'll give them this. I mean, despite them getting clogged up and stuff, they are just little energizer bunnies. They just keep going. Um, they, they make a little bit of noise if you've got them ramping up and down heavy, but uh, I'm... They're pretty darn simple. I mean, there's no power supply to it. You just plug it in. So if you just want it to be on, you could do that too. Um, you know what, man? When you were doing that review, that pump looked so big in your hand. But in the, <laughs> in the tank, it looked so tiny. I know. It's it's definitely a little different perspective when you're looking at this. I, I, I thought you were running like those little Coralias. Because <laughs> that's what it looks like in the tank. But... I, I would say that it's kind of it's almost fist sized. Yeah, it, it's it's got a decent size to it, but still, I think it's it's a pretty nice little package for forty one hundred gallons per hour. This is the biggest one they make. So, but that's that's more or less my water flow in here. I'm um, Ryan L. Gill said, "Oh man, I I remember when they were I bought it when it was first released." And they were trashy. The new ones are a lot nicer. I, I agree. Um, Stan is saying if you have the XF ones, which I do, you can update the firmware. I didn't know that. So maybe I have to update the firmware. Um, but what I did is I really don't even use the controller. I just connect them to my Apex. I got a guy on Reef to Reef. Um, I got a good deal where I have two controllers. Um, and I hooked them up to the Apex. It would be very expensive. I just got someone who was looking to like break down his tank so I got a good deal but otherwise you have to buy two separate controllers at 125 each to hook them up to your apex but um I, I got a good deal I like my gyres I really do yeah I, I just think that the the way they produce the water flow uh, it's just so much nicer because it's that big wide beam of it um, and there's a little sand stirred up right now in here, so it might be a little bit more in the way of stuff floating around. But, you know, my big thing when I built this tank was that I wanted an LPS garden with lower flow. And despite these being 100% flow and random, I don't, nothing over here gets beat up. That's the best thing about the gyres is even when you're running them at 100%, first you can put them all the way to the top, uh, almost at the water line. You can turn the cages, and it's not like an MP10 where if something is six inch, well, let me not single out MP10, but any of those prop pumps, if something is six inches away from it, it basically you're going to tear the flesh off running it at yeah. full blast. But the gyre, for some reason, because it's a thin sheet of water, I'm not saying if something isn't close, but you put it to the top, unless you have a coral right at the water, you know, right at the water line, it can always shoot like a thin sheet across the top. And um, basically, I kind of mimic BRS, where the two pumps ramp up and down throughout the day. So basically, where the two pumps crash, just moves across the tank left to right all day. And I like it. Yeah, and I think... Well, the way that this is set up, too, is that because I, I looked at that and I remember we talked about it once and I I kind of get a little bit of that in a sense because one half of the tank is pushing fast. The other tank is pushing slow. But because it's random pulses, those two bodies of water kind of meet, you know, th kind of randomly throughout the tank. So you'll get some kind of weird flows that happen from time to time. Probably not as much as they got going on, but still, you get some. And and CJ did a good video. Um, basically, I would say CJ um, kind of mimicked the – CJ took the controller because he's just a crazy person who's going to sit there and program. The, I swear, when I try to mimic CJ's programming, it took me about an hour. But CJ basically, with the controller, um, mimicked BRS 
um, programming, I would say he got it 90 to 95% of the way there with just a controller for $275 for for $275 cheaper. So if you're looking to mimic that BRS flow, um, I think CJ has a video on his channel about programming the gyre. That's that's actually a very good watch. Yeah, I'll have to see if I I get that in depth to doing it one day. I might I might have to do that. It's frustrating. I gotta say it's it's, I, it's a frustrating task to do. I'll say when I I threw it on here and you know right now it's just ramp up, ramp down, and that's that's all it's been doing. <laughs> and I I guess I look at that and I go, it's easy. <laughs> I don't have to spend time on it. But yeah, I might have to do that one day. All right, well, are we ready to look at filtration now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's where the good okay. stuff happens. So... Just so everyone knows, I walk through this lovely door to get into my filtration room here. So this is the main body of what goes on in this tank. Uh, this is my DIY protein skimmer. I built this. Uh, I machined all the rings, everything, all the white PVC parts on it that you see, they're all machined. I did that all myself with a, a plunge router and a circle cutting jig that I made for about a dollar. So, and the skimmer works pretty good. I made, I made everything for the cup here. You can see it's a nice thick foam. And this was last cleaned on Sunday. And I eh, can't really tell. There's just a little bit of liquid in the bottom. It's a very dry, thick skim that gets pulled out and the way the water comes to the skimmer is kind of interesting because this is not a traditional skimmer in how it's fed uh, this line right here is my drain line for the tanks which the best thing I could say is think about your sink uh, for your kitchen sink so there's six drains on these tanks, three inch and a half drains per each tank. They run down the length to this line here, which goes down. It U's over and then pops up the other side and it's slightly lower on this side. And then the water gravity feeds to here, which is my tray for filter socks if I so desire to use them, which most days I do not. Or it goes down this line here, which feeds into the skimmer chamber. So this protein skimmer is gravity fed. There is no pump other than the main return pump feeding this. Wait a second, wait a second. I was talking to a few other reefers today and I mean, we were amazed that you actually built your own skimmer. And I remember the process of you tuning it when you built the thing inside, you know, to create more pressure. But are you telling me that you calculated that so that's all gravity fed where you don't use a feed pump? Yeah, there's no feed pump. There's only two pumps, to, uh, two needle wheel impellers on it for two needle wheel pumps. That's it. The rest is all gravity. Now, how do you get how do you get the idea to like just build this and like do those calculations to ensure? Because I I don't know if I don't I just all right. Let me let me catch my breath here for a second. I don't know a lot about skimmers, but I'm thinking that it for, for most of them it's a it's a finely tuned process between mixing water, air, you know, um, pressure on the pump. That's why. So how did you, were you able to calculate all of that when you're building it or was it just a learn as you go type thing? A lot of it with this was kind of learn as you go. I mean, my thing was, is that I needed to be able to get water to a certain height. And I took that this, this, the dimensions of the skimmer itself are similar to that of well, I basically, I took a commercial version of a reef octopus that was out there 
and they have some drawings on there. They have PDFs with actual drawings and measurements. So I took one of their commercial ones that costs like three to five thousand dollars and is smaller than this, and I just scaled it up. So I I didn't try to reinvent the wheel per se with it. Uh, the flow into this I knew would be uh, probably the biggest challenge, but I I and I played around with this quite a bit because initially how I had it the the gate valve there was actually in the outflow of the skimmer, but it couldn't be there. It, it needed to it needed to go here to force water down into this. And then this right here is the outflow of the skimmer. And it, it is, um, it does have a reducer on it. I think it's to three quarters or half an inch. So it makes a back pressure and it holds the water up higher in here. And you could see the bubbling coming up in here right now. Mm -hmm. how, how do you get the air in the skimmer? How do you get air in it? Where does the air? So there's there's two air draws. So there's uh, this guy right here, which is off right now, but it goes to this line, which, and I think I just, yeah, yep, knocked the hose loose. Hold on a second. Give me one second, let me flip this around real quick. No problem. Not at risk of causing a flood, right? No, we're good. Oh, it's... I didn't glue any of these fittings on purpose. So all the fittings on the skimmer itself there are all push fit in. Oh. Because if I need to do maintenance, and it's all glued together, there's no way I can get it out. So, yeah, the, the pump just kind of came off the body here while I was touching the airline, that's all. But this 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 airline, it goes around and uh, right there is a little chamber with activated carbon. And then that goes up and outside. But what pulls, so, air, what pulls air in? The, the Venturi for the so you can kind of see it. So this airline here is actually coming in here. And this is it here. And it goes down into that venturi there on the intake of the pump. Okay. So the pump is sucking it in. Ah, okay. So, and there's a second one that the air intake's actually back here. And then like I said, it, it comes out comes up here and that helps to regulate the water height in here and make sure that it stays as close to this uh, top area as I can get it. And then it's uh, 16 inches to the top of the skimmer neck. And you can kind of see it. I have this, uh, I have my own little modification in here to help uh, restrict the airflow in here a bit because the this is eight inches and it was just not enough air pressure to push the foam up so by putting this in here it reduced the air volume and increased pressure so i remember when you made that modification and it's worked out really well i only took it off uh, for a little while when the uv sterilizer was installed and how often do you clean the collection cup on that? How often does it fill? Um, well, the most it's ever gotten in it is about like that. But this is the size of a five gallon bucket. So there's a couple of cups of skimmate in there. But I clean it more so because, I mean, you could see just how dirty this is. There is like, Sometimes in that little center divider and on the neck of the skimmer, there is like a quarter inch thick layer of skimmate in there. That's just like caked on. So I usually try to do it a couple times a week. Uh, I don't mind though, it only takes a few minutes. Any plans for an automatic neck cleaner at some point? 
No, because if I was going to do it, I'd have to, I'd probably want to do it with drain lines and things like that. And I really, I, I did install a drain, but I really want to avoid using it because those things tend to make me a little nervous. I, I don't think it's really possible for this skimmer to overflow unless like somebody dumped in like laundry detergent. But uh, I, I, I don't really have any plans for it. I, I guess I've been doing, I, I've been keeping tanks 20 years and it's just something I could do in a few minutes. So, um, Retro Reef said he's a plumber and he does aquarium plumbing many times weekly. And he's at a loss for words for your system, which is kind of what I am. Well, here, let me, uh, I'll, I'll take off a couple other panels here so you guys can actually see the guts of this a little better. in time all right now you're gonna be able to see a little bit more so we got one pump that it, it draws from inside and then it, it injects it into the bubble chamber and the bubble chamber is a 12 inch piece of 12 inch diameter PVC with a, a custom bubble plate that I made um, water outflows here, and then here's the exact same setup. Here's my other water or air draw right here, and this has a silencer on it that I put on. See so it here? Just how big of a difference it does make. And then the rest of it's just uh, open, other than my uh, my Neptune probes. Uh, I just added a feed pump for the calcium reactor to give it its own, and then the feed pump that uh, for the UV and the 150. Wow. Question? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to process all of that. Yeah, <laughs> kind of at a loss of words. Yeah. I, I, I followed, and I mean, you know, live streams together when you were putting this together, but I... I am. I'm still at a loss for words. How you built all of this out. And you can't really see, but there, this whole thing it sits on its own PVC platform because there is a a 16 inch um, opening on the bottom of this, like a screw on lid, mm -hmm. and so it wouldn't sit flat. So I machined an opening that I machined that piece of PVC to sit this on here flat, and then there's a uh, it's on stands a few inches off off the bottom as well so that way uh you'll notice there's cinder blocks in here because this whole thing is buoyant and without them it would float to the top like a cork uh, when you say machined like do you have access to the machines to like machine <laughs> no just I, I i guess i just refer to that anything with my router i'm if I'm building and manu, if I look at it as I'm manufacturing parts like these rings, I, I just call it machining. Okay. I guess I don't. I, unfortunately, I don't have a big mill or uh, anything like that or a CNC. I'm sure somebody with a CNC could have whipped it out uh, an hour or two with the, the right skills. But no, nope, all hand tools. No, uh, no big fancy machines there. Same thing with my my trays. I, I I built all these myself. I first found your channel, I think, Alex, when you were doing experimenting with impellers for the skimmer. Was it, was it you were doing imp Was it you were doing different impellers, right? Yeah, let me uh let me grab one of those. Yeah, the bubble choppers. That's when I found him too. Yeah, that's when that's when I found him. When he was doing <laughs> A couple different was going like the custom, the yeah. custom bubble, and bubble basically covers. you designed it yourself. You just sent it out to be, you know, to be made. Quick yeah. question, Alex. Sure. What was the motive? What was the motive behind DIY versus industrial? Um, like going the industrial route. 
what made um, you go DIY? Was it cost or was it just that's just part of it was a, you're just a DIY guy? Part of it was cost. Um, there, there was a lot of motivation in the cost factor because, uh, so like, the, let's take this protein skimmer for instance. Um, I actually just had someone that was asking me to build one for them, and I, I, I it's not cost effective to to buy one like this or have me build one. Um, but to buy a commercial skimmer, and I figured this could probably handle something maybe a little bit bigger. I could probably get all the way into the 2,000 gallon range. Uh, you're talking $5,000 for that skimmer. And wow. this- So how much this, is this, Romeo? This skimmer, and I, I'm not counting my time and how much my time costs because I take enjoyment out of doing it. But to build this whole thing, as far as paying for parts, pumps, this costs about a thousand dollars. So there is a huge savings yeah. in in doing it yourself. I I do know my limits. I I, I did not try to build my own calcium reactor. Um, I was thinking about it, but I I decided to go against trying that. Nah, I would have. I would have loved to see you do that. You should. Yeah. I mean, after a skimmer, a calcium reactor seems like. Yeah, like child's play. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you should just build one for the kick of it. You know? Well, there there is a chance in a few years that this might not be all the tanks that are here. Oh boy. Oh, what? Uh huh. Well. <laughs> Hopefully my wife's not watching. You see, there's a there's a lot of space here. Um, the other thing is is like my furnace and hot water heater and water softener and utility sink. You know, if I have to replace these, they might be able to get relocated against the wall. You know, somewhere down here. And then, you know, I have a giant space here as well. So I, I don't make no promises. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe one day I will, I will do another. I think if I do, I'm going to grow. I, I will have giant SPS colonies that I could frag and sell to pay for the new system uh, if yeah. I ever did. Mike the Reefer says, hi, this is Alex's wife and tell him hell no. <laughs> that's okay. Last time Rico that's was her, over my her, house, that's, that's that's her lurker account. Yeah, yeah. I I know. Um, business is saying if it was him, we would be out on reef tanks. The whole basement would be full. Um, I I I think so too. Yeah, it's. I mean, I I basically took what I wanted to do for a dream, and. I thought about the budget I had, my timeline, you know, and I always wanted to do two big tanks next to each other, one to be a reef and one to keep big fish or non-reef safe fish. So that's, that's why I have two tanks instead of just one. You know what you're you're letting me think about that too because every now you know I, my wife is like fully entrenched in the hobby now and what happens she'll come with me to reef a palooza and all these places and she'll see like angel fish and some you know like mm -hmm. star ass and and she'll she'll say hey we can't have that and i'll say no we can she'll say there's some yep. nice angels there are some when you get into the non-reef safe the colors there's some beautiful angels so I can absolutely see, you know, you know, doing something that's like a predator next to a reef. You know, and, and that's just it. It's the last time I had a tank. Literally, we go to the store and she go, I want that one. And I go, no, that's an angel. We're not doing that. How about, you know, that, you know, how about that one? The bird one? No, no, we're not doing that either. <laughs> that That's how it is now. Like, oh, I want that. Oh, that's a French angel. Like, that gets to be foot long and it eats coral so those euphilia you love it's gonna munch it 
and she'll just yeah. go down the line and like, we want that one. Can we get that one? Can we get that one? And that that's exact that mimics it exactly. And surprisingly, and I'm probably gonna add another one. There is a cleaner shrimp in here, <laughs> even with the puffers. Ooh. And uh, the funny thing is, I have looked at this tank at like. 6 a.m., 6.30 in the morning when I'm getting ready for work just to come down and check. Yeah. And I've seen the, the porcupine puffer hovering a few inches off the bottom with the cleaner shrimp on his back. <laughs> <laughs> just going for a ride, cleaning him off. So, but no, that's that's exactly why I did this. And, you know, I, well, like, I've done some crazy stuff in here because I'm, I'm kind of shocked that more people have not gone. How are you keeping four purple pseudochromus in one tank together? Are you crazy? Yeah. And how are they doing with each other? So there is a pecking order. Uh, and a couple of them don't come out as much. But they haven't killed any of each other yet. Like, uh, there were some torn fins. But surprisingly, they mostly all stay in this rock structure. You know, and like, there's a, you can see two of them there, one there, one over there, one's up there, and one back there. So they, they're very much aware of each other. Um, but so far, been, so been a month and a half. I mean, they got beautiful color, but I also put them in here because I said, despite their tiny size, they will, they will be bullies if they can. No. I was thinking of adding what well, you can't beat the color on those things, but I, I I don't trust them in a in a seventy five yeah. and, and trying to get catch some, a fish. Trying to get, get some royal gramas. Royal, get some royal gramas. Yeah, seventy five is big enough. You could probably do a trio of them. So, all right. Back to filtration. <laughs> <laughs> so, the man of this pump here it feeds the 150 refuge, and then this is an 80 watt high output UV sterilizer mm -hmm. that I have installed here. Uh, so this only does about uh, 450 gallons per hour. I put it on so it'll nuke anything that goes through it. So it nukes algae, it nukes pathogens. Um, and I saw a very large increase in my ORP when I put this thing on. Uh, I don't have my ORP probe on anymore because of the calcium reactor. Uh, but, you know, the, I've been reading more and more about UV. It's hard to find good sources for some of it. But um, I'm really kind of digging the oxidation effects that it can have. Um, Cause I don't, I, I, I do have some friends that keep telling me to put ozone on here and I am not, I have, will not put ozone on this tank. I, I was just about to ask you that. Why not? Uh, well, if you start reading what the CDC talks about with ozone and what it does to the human body, mm -hmm. um, cause I mean, it's an oxidizer and it breaks down organics. So if you start to have leaks and you're not neutralizing all of it and you start breathing it on a regular basis, yeah. Um, you can develop respiratory problems and, you know, who knows how far down the line it's going to happen, but I, don't, I just, I get nervous with stuff like that. And um, UV and I think ozone, I, I think, I think UV has more benefits than ozone without the danger. Um, I was using ozone and the thing I like about ozone, well, when I was using it was the steamer I was using it connected to the intake of the pump, and then it would it would pull in whatever it needed. You know, the ozone generator generated the ozone, mm -hmm. and then pulled in whatever it needed. Once I skimmer, this, this new skimmer, this new Kunzi skimmer, it, what is it? It doesn't have a venturi, so it doesn't actually pull in the air. You have to pump the ozone through it, and that's when I felt very uncomfortable about, you know, maybe pumping too much, too little. So that's when yeah. I felt but the other thing is, as well, is that I never designed this skimmer to deal with ozone, and I, it's not sealed, so I don't know. I, I just get nervous about it. Uh, I agree, but that's that's just me. 
I agree. I put an ozone on for, for I've probably been running ozone now for about a month. And I'm happy with it. it it's given me yeah, I, I like it. I like the um I like the So But I um, and this is my hundred fifty gallon refuge tank, which it looks like an absolute mess right now. The bolster, the refuge tank. I haven't been into clean lately, and... No, nah, don't clean it. <laughs> I like it. I like uh, it. The Chato's still growing. The UFO's doing good. There's only one LED that's burned out, and it burned out in the first week, so... You're only one in one UFO? Yeah, just a single blue burned, and that that was it. Okay. Um, this, this thing's... Well, this light's gonna go eventually. I don't know what's gonna go in its place, but I'm... I'm either going to get some kind of planted tank, um, light like a Kessel, or I'll just get another UFO. They make, sure a, they make a square version of the UFO. Is that what you had up there? No, this is the round. This is uh, 270 watts. No, yeah, they make a beefier one. Oh, and I see somebody's out today. Who's that? What is that? That's my no, mantis shrimp. See if I can't get a little better view. But no, well, so that that's the the refuge and the my little in tank algae scrubber in there. Um, don't mind the mess here. Uh, mm. Which we never did talk about these. These are the needle wheels I made. Well, yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, you totally forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, I. I started bumping things and I heard something happen here. What's going to happen when Alex goes on vacation and needs someone to come in? <laughs> Listen, somebody will come over. If Alex asks somebody to babysit the tank, they'll come over and just like, just get pissed off and walk away. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> no, I'm saying if you ask somebody that tanks it, if you ask somebody that tanks it, they're screwed. You're gonna come over and be like, "Turn that doodad right there." You're like, "What doodad?" <laughs> what do you do when you have to go on vacation, Alex, for like a week or something? Uh I haven't had to yet, but a lot of that is, uh, most of this is pretty self-sufficient. I got. Uh, uh, Neptune ATK for auto top off, which that can give me over a week of auto top off water without needing to uh, add more to the water storage tanks. And then, wait, what's the uh, reservoir? What's the reservoir? Uh, it's well, there it's restricted to 40, 40 gallons or so, dude. That's like because I, I, it, it's 200 gallons total, but. I purposefully did not put the pump all the way down in the tank. It's only down so far because gotcha. I didn't want to accidentally do a pump out that's too much for the tank. Okay. That's smart. Very smart. So that's that, that's basically like a physical fail safe. Yeah. So even if it pumps out 40, even if I pump 40 gallons of water into the tank, mm -hmm. it won't overflow it. It'll lower the salt down a little bit, but I don't even think it would put it in a danger level. Nice. Um, All right. So, needle wheels. Ah, there's the other one. I had them out for something else. These are the two styles of needle wheel I made. Um, I think I did three, three DIY videos on how to do this. It's a lengthy process, but I documented it as best I could. Mm-hmm. Um, all you need is uh, a drill press, some acrylic, some hole saws, <laughs> acrylic glue, and some drills, <laughs> and a whole lot of patience to drill all these tiny little holes if you decide to do the the complex one. Now, quick question. How, how, how did you go about, like dictating the performance based on the, the, the needle wheel impaler. Um, is it just like you just took the drill and just made as many holes as you could possibly fit given the surface area or 
was it well, something I tried to do I tried to do something that I could I could evenly space them out. And you could see there's a little bit of cracking from the acrylic glue just because I dumped so much on there. Uh-huh. But essentially I just I kind of winged it on this. I didn't do any real specific measurements. Like as I found a, a you know, I just kind of felt the distance out and I said that looks about an even space. Yeah. Now I'll go around, drill all the holes, go to the next row, do the same thing. And then I didn't want to get too close to the edge, so I stopped there. And then I looked at, you know, I took the base impeller and used that as a guide to give me a diameter and then a height, more or less, of the impeller that I could go with. I think I had a little bit more clearance, so I, I made it a slightly bit taller. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of this is just, you know, I look at all the needle wheel and... Uh, what the heck you call them uh, like the bristle wheels and stuff that are made out of materials other than like acrylic or regular plastic yeah i mean they're all submerged pumps they're not spitting off at a crazy high rpm to where balance is going to be like ultra critical because once you inject air into something the balance is yeah, completely the harmonics, gone yeah the harmonics is completely gone yeah. not even not even that just like it being in a saltwater environment, building up, um, you know, building up crud on the pump. Harmonics is kind of like irrelevant. Yeah, and I, I just looked at it. I go for the cost of one of these pumps. I go, I, I, I don't feel, especially when I see us some of the other needle wheel designs out there, that it's going to really make a big difference. Yeah. So, um, and you know once i got them made i think the hardest part was just getting it secured to the shaft properly um you know getting a, a hole size in here that would be a tight fit and then i had to make a, a shaft key for it out of acrylic and glue it in place yeah so i tried it i tried one without a shaft key and it worked for about a week and a half <laughs> and i noticed there were no bubbles coming out and i said what's going on and i looked down and the impellers just the impeller's not moving, but the pump's on. <laughs> so, kind of just spinning in place. Crazy. So, uh, any other questions on, on impellers or skimmer or oh. sterilizer? That is, um, that's, no, 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 no question on the filtration. Um, I think, since the, um, Calcium reactor is right there. Is that a geo? Yes, it is. It is the commercial rated geo, the biggest one they make. Jeez. He told me this should handle up 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 and over two thousand gallons. So, what's, uh, your, what's your consumption these days? Um, uh, well, I'm kind of all over the place right now. So the reactor is, my calcium has shot up to about 500. Uh, the alkalinity, though, is still being consumed at a very high rate. Um, so when I first put the reactor on, I was dosing calcium and alkalinity together. Because uh, I don't test the calcium generally as often. Just because it, it always moves with the alkalinity most of the time. But when I put this reactor on, that changed a bit. Uh, so now I'm just dosing alkalinity. The calcium really hasn't moved. It's just staying kind of stable. So I'm still kind of, I'm still, I, I'm still being very cautious with this reactor, though. I do not want to overdose because that will be very bad very quickly. Yeah. Uh, I did put it on its own feed pump though. Uh, having it on the manifold here did not work out very well. Uh, there's just too much difference in the way the water pressure moves onto the sterilizer and then this. And then if I drain water, I got this little drain set up. I could put a five gallon bucket if I need water for something. Every time I touched any of that stuff, the, the drip rate on this thing would get completely thrown off. Um, we'll, we'll see it, how it does on its own pump. If that doesn't work, I might I might move to a peristolic pump at some point. Gotcha. Yeah, peristolic's definitely the way to go. 
Yeah. Because even even having a regular pump, you're still gonna have to do like maintenance on it, so the flow rate. You know, have you ever thought about um timing like a flow monitor and uh, module um that can control the pump? Like, I've like been with, thinking about that, and I yeah. don't. That's the one thing I haven't really looked at with like the flow monitors, like how low of a flow can it really detect accurately? Gotcha. Um, how low do you want to go? Well, that's just, <laughs> and, and that's, that's the part of the thing. I mean, you look at my drip rate right now and the thing's almost a steady stream and I can almost guarantee it will have to be a steady stream. Um, I just want to take my time with it. So like yesterday, well, the last couple of days I've been turning the CO2 up and turning the water flow way up. So, but um, I think um, I know Biz is in the chat, but they do make a needle wheel flow meter. Um, yeah, they do. Like that's they have one that's like a quarter inch. Um, I'm checking on both resupply now, but uh, yeah, I think there is a there. I think there's a quarter inch. Yeah, if they have something like that, I might I might go to that. I think the because the big thing I want to do is once I get this kind of dialed in to where it's somewhat steady, you know, I have the feeling I'm going to have to put a lot more flow through it. And I think what's really been difficult on it is even with the pump is that that really high back pressure on the pump is just, you know, it creates a little more challenges to having a steadier flow coming out. But it, it's still going to take some time once I get it kind of leveled out. I'll see how it behaves, and then, yeah, if it's not behaving, I'm going to have to go to another solution with it. Um, Biz says he have he has one, the needle wheel one. Um, he, he doesn't use it anymore because he runs his calcium reactor from his dose pump. Um, but um, I know it's, uh, yeah, it's a quarter inch. Um, I'm not seeing what the flow rate is. So that's interesting. Um, usually on these, you um, you can tell what how you know what the flow rate is, but I'm not seeing it. Yeah, it, it's definitely gonna be something I'm gonna because that's my big thing is how how much am I gonna have to turn this thing up? Because that's the only other thing with the peristylic pumps is um, to get a continuous duty rated one for the water flow that I have or probably going to need in this eventually, they get very expensive. And I almost wonder if you could take um, some kind of flow control valve like that that measures your flow through and hook it up to some kind of DC pump and then program it up to where if it's not getting enough flow through the reactor, tell it to turn the pump up a little bit. Ooh. To try and maintain its flow. Ah, I see. Okay. But I do have this thing wired up with the Apex, um, so it does have. Uh, it is set up to shut off the CO2 at the pH and the reactor gets too low. That is one thing that is set up. So it's got a double fail safe on it. Uh, from the pH probe, if it goes below. Uh, I think it's six point six point five is where this this stuff's supposed to go, and I think it's slightly below that. It's like six point four four or four eight, something like that. If it hits that, it will shut the solenoid off, and it will close that, and then it will also de-energize the carbon doser. Uh, it it the quarter inch one does from three to twelve gallons per hour. Three to, yeah, that's what it measures the quarter inch. Okay. Um, but um, and, the, um, the business says he uses his dose, like that's the Neptune system dosing pump, um, and he sets the flow rate in Apex, so he can tell it exactly what flow rate he wants, and it pumps it. But um, he says the downfall that it's loud, and the heads have to be replaced every six months or so. Yeah, that I did look at the dose and my my. My hang up with that is it's it's not continuous duty cycle rated, and I, for the water volume, I'm eventually gonna have to push through this. I'm gonna burn through heads like crazy. 
Yeah. That well, that's what he said. Every six months or so. That's that's pretty quickly for adult. Yeah. Yeah, and I I kind of wonder what the volume I have if I'm gonna be doing like every three months or two months. <laughs> so, uh, but so far, I mean, it it is. It's working. It's it's cut me down to just a couple cups a week of alkalinity, so I've cut it in half. But again, I'm just trying to take my time with it. Um, You're a patient man. I know. I that one I'm not letting go. So it's not too rat nasty up here, but this is my apex. Um, I try to do as much cord management as I could without throwing it behind things and letting it get even worse. So it's loaded up pretty decent. It controls uh, all the refugium lights. It controls the calcium reactor. It has the, the lighting on here, which uh, at least the, the radions, it controls those. The T5s are on uh, outdoor rated timer for the, the two different colors I have running. And also, the big thing that the Apex does is it serves as a, a double redundancy for my temperature controller, which is over here. And I'm still, I'm still waiting for someone to ask me why I have black electrical tape over everything. Well, so. Why do you? Salt creep? <laughs> no. Uh, Humidity? Nope. Uh, I keep black electrical tape on everything, so if I come back here to view bioluminescence, I don't have to see the lights. Because even those tiny lights are enough to mess up your vision. Gotcha. So, oh, you but yeah. are, you're that guy who did that video and that article about bioluminescence. Ah. Yes, <laughs> I did write that free free for it. Oh. Yeah, I remember. So, uh, this is a Renko controller. It's an industrial temperature controller. Uh, this is what controls my heating. I do not use electric heating in this tank. I uh, I use natural gas and my hot water heater in the house. So no electric heaters at all in this tank. I have I have some on standby if I ever needed them, but there are none physically in the tank at all. Wait, 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 wait. back up a second. How do you use your how do you use that to heat the tank? Okay. So, <laughs> the temperature controller here huh? has a temp probe on it. And basically, it's an on-off temp switch. You could set it to turn power on for a high temp or a low temp. So, it's just a single-stage controller. And so, it's wired up. It's got two wires in and out and then it has its temperature probe which I put my temperature probe uh, down here as close to the overflow from the tanks as I can get so I have the most accurate tank temperature and it's also farthest away from the heating coil so this temperature controller is set to 70 uh, maintain 78 degrees which it's actually a little bit lower to that because you can only set whole degrees with this thing. And I think I have it set, let's see, degrees Fahrenheit. It's got a one degree difference at Laos, which now you guys can't really see it that well. So it, it's meant to, if it, if it drops one degree below 78 degrees, it turns the power on. So when it energizes, it goes through a cord that's wrapped all the way around here and is attached to this guy right here, which is my heat pump. This is controlling a loop of water to my hot water heater, which in turn, too many things over here. Try not to make a lot of noise and I lift this up. And it goes into this coil here, which is all PEX. Okay. And I use radiant heating to heat the tank. Okay. That PEX, PEX loop comes in there, comes out there, 
pump controls it. Pex goes all the way down. And it goes back into the hot water heater tank here for the return. And I splice out right here is my hot water line to feed. So it's one continuous loop. Gotcha. Okay, that was that was surprisingly simple. I simple, started, very simple, right? Yeah, I thought it was gonna be like a really complex system, but nope. I know that. That's really simple. Yep. So all the Ranko controller does is it tells this pump to turn on and it energizes this pump. And this pump will run until it's got the until it de energizes and we've got temperature. The Ranko controller is plugged into the apex and the apex is set up to where if the temperature gets too high, it will automatically de-energize the Ranko controller. So I got double temperature redundancy on that. And I will, let me go to the graph here and I'll show you guys my apex graph for temperature. If it's a straight line, I'm going to kick you. Oh, uh, well, it might as well be. <laughs> so, now remember, this is one degree. This okay. is 70, 76.8 to 77.8. So, in this time, my temperature minimum 76.9, average 77.39, maximum 77.9. That's my temperature that is- graph. That is a one degree variant between the top of that graph and the bottom? Yep. More or less. Can you dial it in any tighter? Uh, no. Because the, the Ranko controller only does uh, one, degree. one degree. Only does whole degree. They, but the apex, so, you can get it tighter. Doesn't move in an hour. <laughs> wait, wait, go back to the regular graph? Go back to the other graph? What the the one hour? Yeah, Jeez. one hour it doesn't move. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you got this is this is as much as the temperature moves in one day. <sighs> I had one heating cycle today. Um, Yo, that's it. That is crazy. I I like now, quick question: um, cooling. Do you tap into your cold water heater? I mean, cold water tank. Cold water heater. Um, ah, <laughs> so if you had a tank, technically you could. Uh huh. Um, but there there are some caveats to doing this. Um, which there is another gentleman out there that uh does this on Reef to Reef that wrote an article too, and I think Blue Carbon Reefing he uses a titanium heat exchanger instead of PEX. Um. There are some <coughs> arguments or discussions, I should say, between the use of PAX versus a titanium heat exchanger. Mm-hmm. Um, I went with this because I found a guy that had a over 2,000-gallon aquarium for fresh water, and this is what he used. Okay. And if you, if you look at my heating with fire videos, I, I go through the whole setup. Um, but the PAX... Uh, the only thing someone said is, well, what if the pecs were to burst, which is highly unlikely since it's not exposed to UV and it's not being moved. Um, plus, it's very cheap, so I can go get another 100-foot roll of it for 25 bucks. Yeah, but if it bursts, wouldn't you be scared of contamination? I would, but I weigh this against... Uh, If you think about, uh, and I'll, I'll throw a good example out there, how many times have you gone on a forum and read or seen a post where someone said, my heater exploded, everything's dead or dying? Never. No? Never? I, seen, I, don't, I don't go on forums. I've seen that. <laughs> oh, oh, that's why. So a, so a good example of it, uh, Joey the King of DIY a few years ago, he had stingrays in one of his tanks. His uh, One of his heaters exploded, killed all his stingrays. Wow. Uh, the failure rate of heaters 
the, the quality of electric heaters has not gone up. For the most part, it's kind of stayed the same, if not dropped a little. And you'll find on the forums that I've I've seen something as extreme as the side of a sump, a glass sump, actually blew out when a heater exploded in the tank. Um, wow. And it, if a heater explodes in a tank, a glass one or even a titanium one, if it leaks a seal, just think of all the metal contamination you're going to get because now you're in salt water with a metal that is highly reactive to seawater. And then you're adding an electric current through it at the same time. It starts cooking that stuff off into the water yeah. quick. Um, not to mention the fact that it could electrocute you, electrocute your fish. It could start a fire. Um, so, yes, there is a risk. Um, but I don't think that it's any any greater than that of an electric. I think it's just safer. And then the big thing is cost. Um a 500 watt heater when I used it for a little bit of time and just heating the 150 um, and I plugged it in the apex a 150 uh, or 500 watt heater draws six amps so I need I would probably need close to 2,000 watts of heating so now we're talking about 24 amps to heat alone wow. so that's more than a standard 20 amp breaker so I'd have to have two electrical circuits ideally just for heating alone and the cost would be astronomical wow i mean just, wow i i see we we get those with heaters i mean just a few months ago paul reef community worldwide his his heater exploded in his tank oh yeah yeah so we i see those all the time for a while yeah. you were seeing a lot of the cobalt heaters that's why nowadays, if you buy like a 200 or 300 watt cobalt heater, the big ones, they actually just spring two little ones together because somehow the big ones were exploding. I've had Jaegers explode on me. I don't mess around with heaters. You know, every time I suspect something is, if I get a bad feeling, I throw the heater out. The one time <laughs> I've had enough, you know, you know those times where you're doing maintenance and you're not sure if you unplugged it and it was out of water for a few seconds? I toss it. Like, I'm not – the one time I've had a tank crash is because of a heater. So I'm sorry, but I put way too much money in this hobby, like way too much than I should. And I'm not – I refuse to lose my tank or anything over a 30 or $40 device. So I always have two, one for my – one for my RODI system that when I'm doing water changes, I heat it. And it's the same size as the main tank. So what I do is if something's wrong, I always have a second heater. I just chuck it. And just put the backup one on the system. I I don't take chances with, yeah. I, I and I, then even then I do. If, let's say nothing happens every two years, I replace the heaters. I just refuse. If everything, this hobby is not cheap, and I just refuse to lose my tank or livestock or anything for a thirty dollar device. I I completely agree with you on that. Oh, and like like when Joey lost those stingrays. Those were like those black diamond stingrays like he has in his 2000 now. I think those stingrays are like over a grand a piece. I don't, I don't know much about freshwater stingrays, but I know they're very expensive. So, and I look at how much money is in a reef tank tied up into the fish, the corals. Equipment, you know. lighting. Think about light. Everything you put in. Yeah. And I mean, it's... When I looked at this, the, the cost of doing what I did, let me just let me think of my head here, three fifty. It's like four hundred bucks. Right around four hundred bucks to buy everything I needed to do that. And you look at the cost of what it would the cost to buy heaters for a tank this size would probably be more than four hundred bucks. Yeah, that is that is a really I think when I get a house that's and then you're not paying it because it's already heat you've paid for it. You just reusing it in a certain yeah. way. And and the risk of a pipe bursting, I think, unless you're screwing around with stuff all the time, is relatively low. And if you did have that worry, the thing is the PEX is cheap. You can go buy another roll of it and just pop it out. I got it with those shark bite fittings that are pushed to connect. You just pop it out and put new stuff in. 
Replace it every two don't, years. Don't the shark... Um, you have the shark bite submerged? No. Oh, no. okay. That's, that's the well. other thing is that... So... <laughs> looking right at it, so... So, that's the connection in. So, it, it's, it's all shark bited off, and then it goes into a T. The closest metal to the tank is on the pump right here. That's it. There's a there's a check valve in it, and then this is it. And from here on out, it's all plastic. Hey, Owen, Alex. Hey, I was just wondering, you're talking about, while we're talking about the heaters, you know, <laughs> old makes me scared now. Um, um, I wonder why one of these companies, one of these uh, manufacturing companies that make other products, I wonder why they... Or maybe I maybe there is one and I don't know about it. I wonder why somebody doesn't make a really high quality heater, aquarium heater. I think that I think a lot of it's cost. I think that it's possible on smaller tanks to do something like an instant hot. You could possibly use something like that with a coil and just make one on a smaller scale. But I think a lot of it just comes down to cost. It's electrically, it's not efficient to heat water, uh, but it's the cheapest solution and they are relatively risk-free for the average aquarist. I think it's when you get into having big tanks or you know any kind of tank where you just have a lot of money tied up into the livestock and uh, you know, you, you start going, man, like Osa, the stupid $30, $40 heater just killed several thousand dollars in animals that I can't just replace. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he mentioned it now, you know, you don't always think about it, but every time the subject comes up and somebody's talking along the same line, it always it always kind of scares, scares me. And you think, I think the same thing he does, you know, man, I put a lot of time and money into the fish and the corals and putting the tank together and everything else just to... Have a 30 yeah, some people have some pretty, pretty yeah. rapid heater replacement schedules. I mean, I've I've seen people doing like six months. They just yeah. throw them away. The one just time, I, the one time I've had a tank crash, and that's to be honest, that's the reason I got an Apex. The one time I had a tank crash, yeah. a heater absolutely failed and cooked the tank overnight. It was a oh. wow. and when you looked at the cost of getting like a Ranko. And then getting a couple timers, I literally had to just put maybe another hundred dollars on it and get an Apex light at the time. And that's how I got into like controllers because it was just it, it, you got eight timers, eight outlets, yeah. and you know, uh, and basically like a heater backup. And I just never looked back. But I, I just that's you know, I've done stuff to my tank that has you know, like. I mess with stuff. I've switched sis. I, I screwed with my, around with my tank too much. But the one time I had deadly equipment failure was the heater, and I just refuse. I spend more money. I spend more money on other crap that I just you know I'm not gonna let a thirty dollar heater you know. Yeah. Well, you and, know I and, got an apex too, oh, and you know that prevents. You know I don't fear you know uh, the temperature going up to ninety five or dropping. But what he's talking about, um, uh, I think you said, who was it, Joey before we killed all the, uh, the fish? You know, if one of these things explodes and, you know, and you got all this electrical activity going on in the tank, you know, that's, that's the, the other fear. You know, it's not just going uh, haywire and cooking your tank or producing your tank. But... Yeah, Paul lost, Reef Community Worldwide, I think, lost maybe a third or so of his corals because his glass heater exploded in the sump. Because of the electricity in the, in, the, in the water? I have no idea why. I think it's just the explosion in the water. Whatever is in the heater got in the water. Yeah, those yeah. those heaters are full of, they're generally going to be like some kind of copper coil. So you're dumping copper straight into the tank, essentially. You know, how much probably varies how long it's in there and everything. But, uh, you know, I think what it comes down to, and you ask, like, why doesn't somebody do something better? And you know, you look at all this stuff that we do, and you go, okay, for you know, an Ecotech light, it's like what eight hundred bucks for a pro, a version of that. 
Mm-hmm. And you'll spend eight, you know, people spent 800 bucks on a light and 500 dollars on a protein skimmer and 500, 600 bucks to get water flow pumps. So I think that they probably could have a market for it, yeah. but it's going to be kind of limited because you're already spending that amount of money on that stuff. And someone goes, all right, I got a heater for your 75 gallon tank. It's perfect. It's foolproof. It will. It's got triple redundancy. It's in line. There's nothing that could explode or harm your tank. Yeah. It's energy efficient. It only costs 500 bucks. You want one? Uh you know, if you caught me at the right moment. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure someone that had a failure would, but I think it's yeah. one of those. Yeah. Th- I think it's just difficult because I did look, and I'm at a big enough system to where I could buy commercial-grade aquaculture heaters. And they don't – they're in-line heaters to where the plumbing just goes through them, and it's like a spa heater almost with titanium. And they're expensive, and they still draw a ton of power. Um, I saw some of them, they were getting into like, oh, you want three-phase aquarium heater? I'm like, no. Too much. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, I would, because even now, I think you, I can pay a little bit more yeah. at, um, and probably get, you know what, I don't know. I think the most expensive heater out there these days is the Cobalt Aquatics. And to be honest, I think... It is, there's a lot of products Cobalt makes that I like, but I don't know if I would trust. Like I said, a few years ago, they had issues where they would have their big heaters with the Cobalt Neotherm exploding. And what they've basically done is when you buy a 300-watt heater now, they just daisy-chain to 150 watts together. So I don't know if they've really solved the issue. They've just you know figured out how to make it a little bit better. Um, and, then, I, and I don't want to pay 150 bucks for a heater. I'd rather replace a $30 heater every year for five years, you know, rather than pay 150 for a single heater. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's the, the hard thing is that. And it's just, you know, and I honestly, if I even if I was going to do like a couple hundred gallon system again, like if I ever build something that's smaller, I'd probably still do the same style heating. Um, I think there is there's still a pretty healthy debate on whether or not you should use something like a titanium heat exchanger or the PEX. Um, I I always look at the PEX. It's it's cheap. It it's used for drinking water, so it should be relatively safe for the aquarium. There's always a chance something could break down, but uh, time will tell for me. I, I get a little worried on titanium heat exchangers that are bought off of eBay or some other place that's a cheaper thing because oh, I don't know enough about titanium and I would suspect like other metals, there's gradings of it and some of them might have impurities. So it could leak something in the tank. It might not ever. Um, the other thing is if something breaks internally in the heat exchanger, it could just as easily cross-contaminate your tank with water straight out of the hot water heater. Yeah. So definitely got to think think through with how you do it. Um, only other thing that I have heard with this, which I had a little bit of a hard time, was that someone said that there is a risk that you could have Legionella grow in the coil. Legionella. Yeah, that gives you Legionnaire's disease. Okay, but it's not but, its not touching the tank. It's not, the water is not coming in contact with. No, if the, if the water sets stagnant for a long period of time, then that's a possible thing to have happen. But my heater runs at least once a day. And I think with an apex, what you can do is you can at least have a flush cycle during the summer when it's, when you don't expect heat. So... You can have it come on for a few minutes every four hours just to flush, even if you don't need, you know. Yeah, and I, I could, well, and I could set up the Ranko as well to do a different temperature variance or something, or, yeah, I could even set up a timer on it to bypass it somehow yeah. and just kick it on. 
So there's there's alternate things I could do, but I find that risk quite low because most homes, the water sits in your pipes all day long. And it, while interior walls aren't insulated, so it's, the water sits in those pipes. Could be for days if you don't use something. Um, so I don't know. It's a, it's a risk that's there potentially, but I think it's pretty low. Okay. All right. All right. Um, do you have, I mean, it's a large water volume, but do you have to do anything about, maybe I missed it, um, but what about cooling? I haven't yet. Uh, the basement is always in the 60s. Okay. Even and it's, nothing's insulated down here. What was that last question? Oh, even in the summer, you're at sixty degrees in the basement. Yeah, my. Well, let me uh, let me go look and see what it's at. Because the other thing is, is I do have a couple of AC vents down here, so if needed, I could push something down into into this space. But let's see, it's sixty six degrees down here right now in in the main basement, and it was like eighty degrees outside today. As of right now, I have a heating problem in my apartment. It's always warm. I haven't hooked up my chiller yet, but as of right now, I is at 85 degrees, and it's not every summer yet. Yeah, so in the fish room right now, so I keep one of these handy-dandy little guys in here. I'm sorry, I can't read it in the camera, of course, but it's uh, 77 degrees in here only. Um, 51% humidity. It looks like overnight it hit 70% humidity at some point in the last 24 hours. So I keep one of these in the fish room area and I keep one in the main basement so I can see uh, where my temperature and humidity levels fluctuate. But the one thing I do have, which um, I didn't talk about yet, is the, the plastic on the ceiling. Um, this entire fish room as I walk behind the tanks here, is all plastified and sealed against the wall with tape. And because I had a flood in my house a year and a half ago, I also keep a, a little emergency drain here so if some water gets from the other side, like my kitchen or a bathroom, it has a place to go without hopefully collapsing into the tank. Um, well, not, not a tank flood. You didn't have a tank flood. When you said you had a you had a flood, it wasn't tank related. No, it was uh, upstairs bathroom. Okay. So cold water line when I was out of town went. So, but everything is covered in plastic, and I have my ventilation here. So this is a 110 cubic feet uh, per minute. So this will clear out this whole room. It'll exchange the air in here. It's every 15, 20 minutes or so is what I, I calculated. Um, I, I don't get anything larger than that. This one has its own humidistat, so it will shut itself off if the humidity gets too low. Um, but I didn't put anything too large in here because you have to be mindful of negative pressure um, in your house. If it's too great of an airflow going out, it will suck things like your chimney air down and your hot water heater and your furnace. Uh, the carbon monoxide, instead of going out the chimney like it should, can get sucked into the house. So I keep this at a low um, cubic feet per minute fan. If I was venting air in and out, I could go higher, but I, I really don't want to suck air in from the outside if I could help it. Wait, how many CFMs? Uh, 110. That's it? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I kept it low. Um, now, that alone is not enough for this room. Uh, Isn't that and, like a regular desk fan? Uh, it's a... It's a... It's a bathroom, like a... Oh, what the heck is like it? Like a bathroom bed fan. It's a, it's a bathroom fan, but it's not meant for homes. It was more of like a, a commercial level. Gotcha. So it's been running for a couple of years now, and it, it's D, it's got a DC motor in it, so it doesn't use a lot of energy. It's quiet. 
It's got its own humidistat. You could, uh, Ranko makes humidistat controllers too. So if you just had a fan you wanted to control, you could tie it into a Ranko controller based on humidity as well. Yeah. Um, but, and that's the other reason everything's covered. Um, if I didn't have everything covered, like all my sumps covered in here, I mean, this, this place would be 90% humidity easily. Um, yeah. So I keep all the sumps, the main sumps covered. Um, so the only thing that's open is part of the 150 and then the tanks. But the, the plastic to me was a really important piece. Uh, I was actually telling Devin on his stream last night, we were talking a little bit about humidity is that uh, if you don't have something that's a moisture barrier to your home and you start letting off large quantities of humidity, your humidity in the house will stay low for a while and it's kind of like a, a false positive and eventually when that's when your house is like a sponge eventually when that sponge soaks up all the humidity it can it's all hell breaks loose everything starts sweating mold starts growing everywhere and by then it's too late um what size tank do you think you have to start worrying about you know humidity that's a good question, and I would probably base that on the humidity in the room. Uh, humidity, when I researched it for this build, um, there's a lot of different ways to mitigate, and a lot of it is based on where you live in your climate. Uh, you don't want it too low, because if it's too low, uh, excuse me, it will encourage a lot of evaporation. And that's why, you know, if I can keep it in the 40, 50% range, I'm good with that. Uh, if it gets too low though, it's just gonna evaporate a ton of water. I mean, I only make, I make 40 to 60 gallons of RO a week. And a chunk of that is used for me messing around with getting new fish, new corals, cleaning things. So, you know, 20, 30 gallons a week is, is all I'm evaporating out of this system. But I, I would say go on Amazon, those little Accurite or, uh, I think that's an Accurite, the little humidistat that's got the 24 hour monitor on it for temp and humidity. Buy a couple of those for like 15 bucks and, and monitor it in your house. If it's getting, um, I consider 70% where I need to make sure that something's being done. I do touch that percentage uh, a little bit, but most of the time it's in the 50s. If it gets over 80%, that is when it becomes ideal for mold to grow. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to Amazon. That, I'm trying to order one now. But get a, get a two-pack. Is what I do is, you know, I look at the humidity out there, but then I also look at it in the basement. Like, it's 77 degrees in the fish room area. It was 66 here, and let me see, the humidity was a little higher. So the humidity right now is only 49% down here. A lot of that's due to the fact that my dehumidifier has been not self-draining the way it should be, though. So between the, the plastified ceiling, the covers on the tanks, the ventilation and a dehumidifier, I've been able to keep it under control. Yeah. I just need, I, I don't know. I just suspect that, because with the living room, I get a lot of evaporation. And then I just feel like, like every year, year and a half, I have to get my carpet stretched. And I just feel like there's a lot of humidity. It's yeah, and I mean, it it definitely could start messing with things that way. Yeah. Just going to grab some fish food here. I, I just have that feeling. I have a huge a humidifier, but then I worry about running it because the tank is in the same room. So if I lower it, is it gonna cause more evaporation? So it's kind of a 
Maybe I need to do some more research on community. That's I, I, I today I started watching DevStream again. I need to, I think I need to watch it and just do some more research on humidity. Yeah, you definitely got to know your levels to start. That's that's the probably the biggest thing. Um, if you know that, it'll at least give you an idea if there's something that needs to be looked at. Oh, my favorite time of the day, feeding the fish time. All right. Hmm. I got something for the big boys today. Frozen half shell clam. Uh, you eat a mixture of rod, a bunch of other foods, clam. Yeah, I got some. I think I got some LRS reef blends, some scallops that I had. And then the rod herbivore blend. Are you are you ever going to automate uh, feeding? Say that one one more time. Are you ever going to automate feeding? Automatic feeding? Uh, yeah, are you, you plan on automating? I I really do want to pick up uh, two to four of those apex ones. So when I go out of town. I could just throw pellets at everybody. Yeah. Uh, that's always something that I do get concerned about when I go out of town is uh, having people feed my fish. Yeah. I, I try so to do I would, it. I try to make baggies and just use baggies and say one baggie a day. Yeah. I was, I was more talking along the lines of like um, frozen. Yeah. Um, automated, like, you know, have the whole little refrigerator with dosing pumps. Um, I saw that, and yeah. I don't know if I'd ever go to that. Just, you, I think it's just a preference for me because, I don't know, I just enjoy this time so much. No, I hear you, I hear you. Because my whole, my the reason why I do is that I can't, I can't imagine, like, how much food it's going to take for your tank to, you know, register, um, you know, like, have a reading of anything when it comes to, like, nitrates and, and phosphates once, you know, you have corals in it and everything, you know, you're going to need, like, a lot of food, I just know. All right. I'm going to flip this around so you guys can watch. So, you can see Fatty here really likes to chew on the clamshell. He actually chews on the clamshell? Oh, yeah, he'll, he'll bite the clamshell directly, too. So, he, the other pupper doesn't like to feed off the clamshell for some reason. I don't know what his deal is, but and it it's really important with these puppers to uh, make sure their teeth get worked, which is why I do this. Because if, if their teeth do not uh, get dulled down, then the only other way to deal with it is through surgery. And I really don't want to have to try and do that. Because I watched it on YouTube once, and it didn't look like a fun thing to do. So if the other puffer isn't eating clams like that, like, what do you think, the, what's the other option? Well, I feed, like, yesterday I actually fed a cocktail shrimp, and he was biting on that through the exoskeleton and everything. Let's see. If, maybe he'll go for it. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, we're going. I have to try and keep an eye on both of them because sometimes, uh, oh, that's not going to end well. Uh -oh. yeah, well. Somebody just stole that piece of clam and took it away. Who did? Who took it? <laughs> well, the puffer got it out, and then one of the wrasses took it, and then the other puffer chased it away. <laughs> yeah, they'll eat it. Somebody will eat it. So... I'm trying to walk around here so everyone can see from the front. 
It's the only thing I think I might do eventually is maybe make a feeding door for the front. I was thinking of putting some glass tops on to see if I can lessen evaporation and, you know, I don't know. That, that will do it. Uh, the one thing is that if you do um, do that, just watch your par because it's going to reduce your par. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I run my, light. I can bump up the lights and I wouldn't mind having to, you know, the thing is, I have a fox face that likes to shoot water out of the tank. <laughs> Yeah, I basically have to clean the outside of the glass every day, much more because he he blows bubbles outside of the tank. It's it's very annoying, Alex. Very, because you leave the tank alone for a couple of days, you have streaks running down even the cabinet. Boy, and they're still waiting for more. They are greedy. All right. So, yeah, and I, I don't feed a crazy ton of food in here. The puffers get a lot, but usually every couple of days I give them a big meal. So, they got a treat today. All right. What about All right. Let's give everybody else a feeding here. Oops. No, I shouldn't have done that. Oh well. So, same thing. I, I It's probably about two to three cubes of food at most that are going in here. Just some bigger chunks of stuff today. I don't know if anyone noticed, but the purple tank's new. He just he just got out of his uh hosp his QT tank for the day today, so he's the new resident. Did you just eat? Yeah, a little bit. Just been picking at the rocks a little bit. Yeah, looks like he's trying. I was hoping to get the rabbit fish in the other one out before I put him in, but yeah, it just wasn't going to happen. So the Wesophilias are protected, though, so I'm not too concerned now. But yeah, I feed twice a day generally. Um, just throw some pellets at them when I get home from work. And then in the evening, like now, I, I do frozen. And just alternate everything depending on the, the day. Does anyone in the chat have any more questions for Alex? Yeah, I hope I covered all of it. <laughs> I think yeah. I did. I think you did. I think you did. Um, we've been going for two hours and ten minutes, Alex. I really thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem. All right, guys. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, EMG, thank you for being in. Um, thank Tim's for joining in. And uh, Alex, I really appreciate you being on. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, so. you, you have a good night, and I will see everyone next week. All right? Thank Sounds you. good. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.